So um, thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, thanks uh, to all of you for um, kind of inviting me and having me. Um, so um, I was listening to the previous uh, session and found it quite interesting that there was a lot of uh, sort of discussion going on about the um, topic of radiology in specific and healthcare in general, of course. Um, and I just want to briefly kind of give you a feeling for how we radiologists work and of course our main project uh, our main product kind of being the report I wanted to kind of explain um, how we create our reports and how the information that we transport with these reports may or may not be uh, accessible to further analysis and to kind of development of AI tools. Um, um, and I mean, if there's some discussion at the end, I would be very happy, of course, because maybe my talk will not go into too much of a detail, but I think it gives a nice feeling about how we work and, and why that may impact sort of um, the way we may or may not be able to help with AI development. Um, so basically just to give you a feeling of course radiology has um, de developed very well over the last years and we sort of, sort of started out with very simplistic methods and moved along to very complex machines that we use every day and uh, of course uh, given the current situation uh, we needed to adapt our clothing as well in parts um, but one thing that didn't really change much over the last um, kind of years and decades is the way we compose our reports. So um, this on the left is one of the first radiological reports that are kind of um, known today. This is from the 19th century, I think, uh, where basically one doctor writes a kind of a letter to another explaining what he saw images because you just so what I saw seemed um, pretty useful and of course that was useful because the other doctor then knew what to do and basically we still do the same although um, the examination techniques developed a lot we basically just write letters to one another of course now they're kind of in a digital format but basically from the structure there's still free text um, letters that are wrote to one another um, and to understand why that may be the case, um, this is and give you a bit of a feeling to how radiologists work, because I saw that in the last talk, there were some very flashy images uh, with multi displays and everything seemed very nice. Um, actually, it's kind of that, but a bit more um, down to earth, maybe. So we basically open up the images and maybe even different sets of images and multiple images for a patient. And we basically interact with the images using the mouse, of course. And then we generally compose the record by dictating into a speech recognition software. So this is important because uh, later on, I will show you why we kind of stick to this method of reporting. So we have one hand on the mouse, which we want to have in the images all the time. And we have another one, another hand uh, on the speech mic. And um, we basically interact with the images and dictate along and we repeat that uh, throughout the day, of course. And that's why um, maybe from such an image, you get two pages of text or whatever. You see the text is in no way, but there's no real um, kind of uh, sequence in how we describe what parts. I don't know, is there something in the chat? Oh, OK. Um, and I mean, this image here, you could describe in various ways. And this is just one image out of the stack of CT images that we see. Um, and I will show you later an, uh, an example just to give you a feeling of why there is no specific relation between one image and one text. There might be a different texts describing the same image. Um, but basically, when we see something like that, it seems very unintuitive to read. There's lots of text going on and we're kind of used from other specialties to get reports like this in medicine um, where you have set of a, a set of normal values you have the values for that specific patient at that specific time and maybe you even have some kind of visual aids that are very easy to get from just seeing if the value is within this range you can 
uh, help the clinician to see which values are pathologicals and which, which ones are normal. So the question may be, why don't we compose the radiology reports in this uh, fashion? For example, just to, to give you one possible um, um, type of report. Uh, in this report, you would easily see that whatever is marked in green or uh, w whatever has very few words describing it probably is normal. And then parts that are in red maybe are especially important and there's lots of text. Uh, and that's where you want to focus your reading on because this, this are, these are the, the topics that are relevant to this patient to guide further treatment, let's say. So why didn't we move to that? Um, and the, this is kind of interesting because the topic has been around in radiology for quite a long time. And uh, I mean, from very early versions here seen on the left in the image, uh, where there were kind of very old school uh, Windows programs uh, where you could click on specific parts of uh, this checklist type of thing, uh, then that would compose your report to more elaborate uh, versions that we might have available today from uh, commercial providers. Um, but this never really took off. And I mean, it would be very helpful, not only maybe to the radiologists, but also to whoever wants to further analyze the data, but this really never got into uh, to routine. And I will explain later why that was the case. Um, and actually, even the radiological societies really promote using what we call structured reporting. So you basically have kind of a template or a checklist or whatever you might call that. Um, and they really promote that they, there is a collection of report templates uh, from the um, European and the North American Radiological Society. Actually, in Germany, we are working on that as well um, and contributing to this uh, report template library. And there are even um, interoperable formats and definitions of standards that could be used to really help promote and uh, integrate structured reporting in, in clinical routine. Um, the reports then basically look like this. So you have maybe you have a kind of a checklist where you can insert free text. That would be already kind of good, but it can even be with drop down menus or check boxes or whatever that are even more specific. But even this basic uh, report template, at least you have some sort of um, definition that what field belongs to what anatomical part, maybe. Um, and it has been shown in the literature that this actually is even beyond, uh, say, data analysis, uh, is very useful in clinical routine. And actually, the referring clinicians, so the ones that will then later treat the patient based on our reports uh, that we provide as radiologists, they very strongly prefer the um, structured reports over the unstructured conventional type of free text reports. So their satisfaction, or they report higher satisfaction with structured reports, let's say, and the, they rate the structured reports as better in terms of clarity and even completeness. Uh, and this is a, a publication that I found particularly interesting, um, where what they did was they analyzed um, structured versus unstructured reports uh, in the context of pancreatic surgery. And um, they defined a set of information that should be contained in such a report because that set of information is relevant to then planning surgery, let's say. Um, and what you can see here in the top row is basically that the non-structured reports, so the ones that we compose using traditional methods, just dictating whatever kind of text comes to our minds as radiologists, they included not, a, well, they included a relevant number of relevant features, but they never, almost never included all of them or even, well, they kind of included most of them, but not always all of them. Um, whereas with the structured report, almost all of them included many more relevant features that the non report. And there may be like different reasons for that. Once maybe you don't dictate what you don't think is important. So the information is basically missing. Although you might have seen it as a radiologist, you thought it was irrelevant because a specific type of finding wasn't there. So you just chose to not include it in your report. Um, but that actually might be valuable information as well. So um, that's one thing. 
that structured reports help to, um, to improve. The other thing is that maybe, well, as a radiologist, you are trained to report on all sorts of images, and maybe you don't really kind of have at, out of the top of your mind the information what is relevant to surgical planning for pancreatic cancer, which is a very specific type of surgery, a very specific type of cancer. And of course, you can never have everything really present. Um, and that's why you maybe didn't even look at some parts of the image that the surgeon knows are relevant to him, uh, but maybe you didn't really think of that. So there are very various reasons why some information may not be included in non-structured reports. And then if you have a kind of a checklist in a structured reporting a template, you know that these are all the items that I need to report on. So I'll have to provide an answer for all of that. These, and I don't even need to think about what should be relevant to the surgeon because it's there just in kind of a checklist. So you make sure that all the reports are complete. And I think this is uh, really important to understand this because if we want to take talk about AI and we'll come to that uh, in a few minutes, uh, that explains some of the hurdles I think um, that are there when you are looking uh, to develop AI tools in radiologists in radiology that maybe even kind of I don't know about this entanglement of course but are really really difficult uh, things to solve I think. Um, so why do we actually stick with these kind of narrative reports if we know that structural reports are so much better? Um, and one of the main reasons I think is that they are very fast and easy to produce. So you just have one mouse in the images, so you can constantly interact with the images, which, which is really important. And you have the other hand to kind of control the dictation. So uh, there is no moving mouses between uh, screens, no need to move the mouse out of the image and to interact with kind of a checklist or whatever. Uh, and you have unlimited possibilities to describe what you want. So you are, there, you are not limited to a set of information or to a set of kind of checklist. Um, and actually something that is probably also relevant is that we as a younger generation, and I would include myself there, we are kind of used to or willing to uh, work with kind of digital solutions for everything basically. But of course, there is a relevant proportion of radiologists that kind of experienced reading films instead of watching monitor or watch, uh, seeing the images on a monitor in which we're used to write on paper. So there's kind of a transition uh, that radiology has seen over the years from paper-based and film-based to digital workflows. And not everybody is willing to adapt to um, new kinds of workflows. So, but maybe may, the most important part here is that you're constantly working under time constraints and pressure. So the faster a solution is, the better it is for you personally, and you're probably not willing to think ahead and like kind of offer possibilities for further digital or further computer-based analysis, because it doesn't really matter to you in your working day. So you just take the mic dictate and you're done and you can go home. But of course, this is kind of problematic because we will not really help further developments, I think, if we stick to non-structured reporting um, and certainly for AI development, where you need data to train your models. Um, if that data is not suitable to training models, that's certainly a challenge for further development there. Um, and actually, the, the funny thing is, if you look at the uh, literature, you see that, for example, there has been this paper where the authors tried to um, detect uh, large vessel, vessel occlusions in, in the brain. And if you go to the methods, and this is something that is really that you'll find in, in most of, of the publications, at least in the radiological literature, you see that they, okay, they included uh, numerous patients, but in the end, uh, they had to re-review almost all of the reports by another radiologist that was just acquiring the data for this specific kind of training of AI. And because the, the information wasn't readily available uh, to start with, because there, of course, there was a report going along with every imaging study, but he couldn't really, they couldn't really use that um, for development of AI tools. And this is very, very time consuming because you have to have the manpower and the time 
to really go over all of the reports again, basically. Um, and there were, are, of course, in the meantime, there have been numerous very high ranking publications uh, using or showing the potentials of AI and radiology. Uh, this one here was published in The Lancet. Maybe some of you have seen that. Uh, and this was a group from India that um, detected emergency findings, let's say, in, uh, in brain CT scans. Um, but again, uh, they, so they had really great results. Luckily for us as radiologists, the radiologists were still a bit better. Um, but again, they had to go over all of the reports and kind of fill out what you see here is kind of a structured report. So they had people, they had time, they invested significant resources to produce structured reports to every image that maybe if we had adapted as radiologists, we could have had to begin with, but um, this is still not the case. Um, another publication, and this is where things get for me very interesting because for the brain CT scans, the things are very simple basically. So if there is a bleeding, you will see it and there is no doubt it is there. That's basically a diagnosis you can confirm from just the images. Um, but this publication here gathered even more um, um, media attention. And what they did here was they had chest x-rays and they wanted to detect pneumonia within these chest x-rays. Uh, and that paper came out initially in 2017 on archive and it was uh, kind of sparked a wave of media interest there because uh, they claimed that the algorithm could e detect pneumonia better than any radiologist. Uh, so headlines escalated to, well, the radiologist may soon be a computer. And of course, this has been mentioned before. There was this famous saying by Geoffrey Hinton that within five to 10 years, I don't really know what, I think it was five years he predicted, uh, radiolog radiologists will be obsolete because uh, everything will be replaced by um, deep learning. Um, and uh, actually this guy, uh, I found out that he's kind of a, an AI guru to some extent, uh, even perpetuated that message that, well, of course, uh, the algorithm will detect pneumonia better than any radiologist in chest x-rays. Um, but if we look closer, um, we can get some very interesting information. So basically what they did is they took uh, 112,000 chest x-rays and from that alone, you can imagine, well, that would be very time consuming to have a human reread every chest X-ray. Um, these were 30,000 patients and they had 14, 14 pathologies that they were or claimed to be detecting in these chest X-rays. And they had some form of uh, neural network there. And um, as you can see here, so they had four radiologists as comparison and uh, the algorithm performed better than the average radiologist. However, it's interesting to note that radiolo radiologist number, number four here performed better than the algorithm. Um, and the question is, what did the algorithm actually detect there? Um, and if you look at the data closely, and there has been um, a guy from Australia, um, the, the link is provided down here that I think has um, um, published excellent blog pieces about uh, this publication specifically and he has been in contact with the authors and to be honest the, the interaction must have been very good and they kind of redacted some of the claim of the initial claims um, but what he did was he, because the data set was available um, he took the data set had a quick look at the images and um, and then tried to relabel all of the images um, and what I forgot to say is because Rereading 100,000 images would have been very time consuming. The authors um, decided to use NLP to extract labels from the, um, from the radi radiologic reports that were going along with the images. Um, and what you can see here is that for some labels, and that, that's what the image behind here should show as well, for some Im um, images, the, there was a relevant discrepancy between what the text mining detected as label for this specific image, uh, as opposed to what the what a human radiologist may my, might have um, given as a label. And um, specifically for pneumonia, as you can see here, there was really, really a big discrepancy. So 
actually the algorithm probably detected not pneumonia, but what had been what the text mining had labeled as pneumonia. And this is very important to keep in mind because actually from one image, there is a, new, a, a number of words with which you can describe the appearance of a pneumonia, but you will never know from the image alone if that patient had pneumonia because there are imaging features that are present in other conditions as well that are not pneumonia, but look very, very similarly. Uh, so actually establishing the ground truth for chest x-rays is very, very difficult and might involve many data sources that apart from the image. Uh, and actually maybe in some cases you will never know what actually produced that image or what, what pathology was really there in the patient because you cannot look inside the patient and even lab values and whatever information you might take along with it, with it, with the image might give you a probability of a pathology, but never give you really the, say, ground truth, the golden uh, golden uh, truth there. And then just as a minor, minor remark there, uh, of course, if you average performances, then you will never be, so well, you will always be below the top performance. So kind of compare it, com a comparison to an average there might not be very fair. And it would have been better if they had kind of computed a convex hull around the uh, performances of the radiologists to really compare it to the algorithm. And um, this uh, is where I want to give you a bit of a feeling for how radiologists might report uh, a specific image. Uh, and of course, this is a lot of text there. And um, maybe we can take a bit of time to read through it. Um, and basically, this should be four different types of uh, reports that would all relate to this image. And I chose a very simple image here. Basically, there's not much to see except for this kind of opacity nodule, whatever you might call it there. And all of these reports here would be perfectly fine um, in relation to that image. So maybe I, as a radiologist, would just dictate what I find important there, and the rest is unremarkable to me. Another radiologist, maybe uh, another radiologist, maybe wants to express every detail of the image and provide a differentiated approach to how he sees what particular part there. Um, and this is very dependent on well your personal style, your personal feeling of what you think is important. Some take into account kind of. Um, they want to be safe against litigation, so they didn't mention every detail to make sure to, to really establish that they have looked at the whole image. Whereas, uh, say, one radiologist who already knows the patient has a cancer makes a very short uh, report there, and that's perfectly fine. There is actually no legal um, yeah, requirement to have a certain length of report or to even report on everything. You can just uh, write whatever you feel is good for. The referring physician, let's say. And uh, if you look at that, there are already, for one very simple image, there are numerous words you could use to describe this one finding here. And for example, consolidation or opacity could be something that you would use in relation to pneumonia as well, because if you have pneumonia, maybe then this part of the image here uh, at the bottom on the left side is kind of white, and that's, of course, an opacity. Uh, somebody would may call that a consolidation, and um, and otherwise there there are lots of uncertainties here in the report. For example, one radiologist might say it's unremarkable. One may say normal, but then if you have normal and cancer or unremarkable and nodule in one report, how do you label that? Is that a normal chest X-ray or is it a, a pathological chest X-ray? Um, and then you have somebody here describing, for example, oh, some, something here in the hilar region looks strange, but it might be lymph nodes or it might be just vasculature. So how do you know what is really the ground truth there? And maybe somebody here... Um, ...expressed that he doesn't really think it's pneumonia, but... Well, it's difficult to really establish what's going on in this uh, image here. 
Uh, and the only thing that might give you certainty is if you have uh, maybe a histolo histology re um, result from a biopsy of this nodule. And only then can you state for certain that in this image, this lesion was a cancer because you had it biopsied and that proved to be cancer. Otherwise, you will never know for sure. And it's even much more complicated with pneumonia because you would never get a biopsy of a pneumonia. There is no indication and it would just be risk for the patient. Whereas for cancer, at least uh, there is some indication and you might get a, a true, um, true label there. So structured reporting um, could help in these situations. And we had some ex examples uh, in our group. Uh, we developed kind of a structured reporting software and we were able to um, generate structured reports. Of course, this meant a significant change in workflow, but as is obvious to you as um, kind of technical crowd, uh, it's very easy to get uh, some nice analyses from there. And we even tried to just prove the concept of using structured reporting to train uh, AI algorithms. So we developed a very simple uh, report template for fractures of the ankle. Uh, and then because basically there is just, if, if you see the fracture, the fracture is there. There's no discussion. There's no need for biopsy, of course. Uh, and with a very limited amount of the, uh, data, we got an okay, let's say, okay performance on the test set. This is very, very simple and probably um, compared to the fancy stuff you do, very uh, kind of stupid, but just proved that, of course, uh, this is very plausible. Structured reporting will help in developing uh, AI tools, whereas if you had tried to do that with the unstructured report, it would have been very cumbersome. So um, I think I'm kind of in time, I hope, and just to, to wrap things up, maybe um, from what I heard today and what is obvious to you, um, AI, to be developed certainly needs high quality data sets and these are very scarce. So um, unless there is some form of getting around some issue and having and eliminating the need for supervision in terms of establishing diagnoses, there's also always the need to have kind of a valid ground truth and to really know what was in the image, but that's kind of very difficult. And um, very cumbersome if you need to invest lots of uh, resources there and text mining would be the obvious choice maybe but then as you can see there's such a huge variation in how a radiologist describes an image that really text mining may cause more trouble than it actually tried to solve and i think for us as radiologists and i have been a very vocal um, about that we really need to, to move to structured reporting to not only help with AI development, but also with other uh, very important uh, topics that we can, could come up with, but that's still not very widespread. And the reason for that, I think mainly is that we did not yet find the ideal solution for us as radiologists to interact with the image and interact with the report that does not really need to move the mouse out of the image window. And um, even then, if you had structured reporting, uh, it would still uh, be a bit difficult to really establish a ground truth uh, because um, you might, might need to include other data sources such as laboratory or histology. Um, but even then there might be uncertainties because like everything in medicine is very like kind of probabilistic and we say, well, this is probably this, but there's almost never a way to really, really be sure unless we have kind of uh, a dead patient and we can do all sorts of tests on him. But since this is, of course, uh, not feasible, uh, there will always be some sort of uncertainty. And, and I think it's just important to keep that in mind because if at first it might seem very obvious, oh, well, we do, do AI on radiology images and it will work fine. But once you dig deeper, then uh, you find that there's so much uncertainty there. It's very, very difficult and needs to be careful evaluated what where you can actually be certain about the diagnosis. And um, yeah, with that, I um, hope I'm in time and uh, happy to hear your questions.